Okay, welcome everybody to our March Communicating Your Science webinar. We're excited to have a great speaker today, Sean Patrick Farrell. P Patrick will be joining us. And um, I, I just want to go through some house cleaning quickly before he starts. He has a great presentation and we don't want to um, use up a lot of his time. So my name is Josephine Peterson. I am the Illumination Space Hub Coordinator for the Advanced Science Research Center. Now the CUNY Illumination Space Hub is our collective space for science communication, outreach, and education. It brings together several programs available at the Advanced Science Research Center and the Graduate Center that really focus on um, providing science communication to a broader community and really focusing on our um, BIPOC, our uh, uh, communities of color and um, those who may historically not be involved in um, STEM and science research. So the um, Science Communication Ac uh, Academy, which is what the Communicating Your Science webinar falls under, is one of the initiatives of the Illumination Space Hub. And this is where we work closely with the graduate school and the other science graduate programs across the CUNY to provide training and education around how best to communicate science to a broader public. The website is there if you wanna check it out. There's a lot more programming, um, including our community sensor lab, um, our science communication fellowships, etc. So um, we're really excited about broadening this program and to be able to continue it, the communicating your science webinar that we've been holding all throughout COVID. So I'm going to ask either Katie or Sarah to jump in and talk a little bit about a symposium that is and would be of interest to uh, a few people on this call, I believe. Okay, hi, I'm I'm Katie. Uh, so I am one of the co-founders of CUNY SciComm, which is a student-led organization to promote science communication skills in STEM graduate students. Um, we've gotten a lot of support um, from the Illumination Space uh, Science Communication Hub at the ASRC. And so I'm just here to promote uh, a symposium that we're holding this June where CUNY graduate students can come and present their work to uh, public facing audiences and have a chance to win a cash prize and get a lot of feedback from their peers, along with some uh, more formal training to help them with the presentation. So this is something we're really excited about and uh, the ASRC has has really helped us pull this together. And yeah. then I think we have one more. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> one more slide. Uh, <laughs> where we kind of have one of our first like mini training events for this symposium uh, next week on Wednesday at the ASRC in person and then also on Zoom. Um, we are bringing in a postdoc from, uh, I believe, I've, <laughs> I've forgotten exactly where she's from, uh, but a postdoc in science communication is coming to kind of talk to us about um, uh, speaking to public facing audience. So I think it's uh, really aligned with the, the talk that we're going to have today. Um, so if you know any students or postdocs or undergraduates who may be interested in increasing their public facing communication skills and would like some free pizza, uh, this event is next week. And I can put the um, registration link for both the symposium and this event in the chat. Thank you so much, Katie. Okay, the next item quickly is I wanted to talk about the importance of the participant survey. And we do have Laura Saxman here, who is our evaluator, who just wanted to chat a little bit about the folks on the webinar today about the survey. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Laura Saxman, and I'm an educational psychologist and researcher. And I'm also the evaluator for this project. So, um, one of the things that we do after events um, and trainings and workshops and experiences that the participants have is send you folks a survey where we ask about what you've learned, your feedback, how it could make it better. It's important for two reasons. First of all, it helps us understand the impact on the participants. And the second reason is that it helps us make these events better by giving us feedback about what worked, what you learned, 
what we can improve upon. It helps us shape future webinars and trainings and experiences that we're putting together for the participants. So I think Josephine is going to put a link to the survey in the chat. Um, so everybody, please take a few minutes um, towards the end of the experience or right after to fill out the survey, be honest, be, um, you know, as objective and, um, you know, give us as much info and feedback uh, as possible because it's really very helpful in shaping the program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Um, the QR code, that very large QR code you share yeah, is actually a link to the survey, but I'll also drop it in the in the chat as well if you want to take your phone and take a, you know, and open up the survey right right now. It'll be available for you on this if on this QR code right here. Okay. So I am excited to welcome our speaker for today, Sean Patrick Farrell, or Sean, uh, Patrick, and he's a video journalist who has worked for Wired, The New York Times, and others. His work reporting on scientific discovery and research have taken him to megafires in Arizona, tracking wolverines in Montana, NASA facilities, and into multiple labs studying human performance. I'm going to um, turn it over to um, Patrick now to share his screen and get started. Hello, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to talk with all of you and I hope to uh, have a conversation. I thought I would start by uh, showing you guys some work that I've done and then we can discuss a little bit about how I talk with scientists as a science communicator, as a science journalist, uh, as a video producer in particular, where I'm looking for things like sound bites. I built a slide deck that I am now wishing that I had spell checked, but I'm going to check it and uh, we'll get it started. And um, if any, if anybody has questions, feel free to stop me. This is, it doesn't look like we have too many people here. We could probably stop things and um, have a discussion. Um, I've got a few things that I wanted to get through, but I, I would love to hear from all of you about what it is that you're interested in and what my experience uh, as a uh, as a reporter, as a producer, can can help you with as you prepare to explain your own research and findings to the general population. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I will do that thing where everybody asks if they can see it. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. All right. So sound bites, scenes, and science. Uh, these are some of the ways that I think about uh, how I'm going to communicate science in my, in my stories. Um, I thought I would just start by showing you one of my favorite pieces, which is um, from a show that I worked on when I was at Wired. It's a few years old, uh, but it's about the the science of uh, of stone skipping, uh, and it's proven to be one of the most popular things that I've ever made. I'm just going to show you the beginning of it, and then we'll have a little bit of talk about um, about sort of how I approached it. And then we can watch a little bit more of it as we get going. Uh, as Patrick, so I'm just, just start up. Yep. Interrupt yeah, you please. Before you start the video, I'm seeing like a black sticky on top of your um, presentation. I don't know if you have a. Um, it's like a square. If you have have an app open to um does that do it that does it yes okay that's it's because it's my notes yes okay <laughs> sorry is that better all right here we go so science can be exciting and entertaining and that was uh one of the things that i worked on when i was at wired was uh, i worked on a show um we'll watch the beginning of it called almost impossible where we were looking at uh at records in sports and so things like the fastest fastball or why we can't run uh, 100 meter dashes in under nine seconds. I mean, the very fastest of us, of course. And uh, so I, it was, in some ways it was a, a physics show, but it was wrapped in a stunt. So the stunt was going and, and seeing if an average person who was, um, you'll, you'll meet him, his name's Robbie. He's a friend of mine who's a science reporter and writer and also a very good amateur athlete. Uh, and he would go and try these sports often with the pros. So I got him together with the world champion stone skipper, 
because of course stone skipping is also competitive and then we got together all of us with a fluid dynamicist uh, to discuss what the outer limit of stone skipping might be and so we'll just we'll start it up here and start watching oh let's get that unmuted. satisfying about skipping a rock if you've ever skipped one five or six times you might find yourself taking a little more seriously see if you can get seven eight nine consecutive skips Turns out some people take stone skipping very seriously and actually compete to see who can skip the most or who can skip the farthest. The current world record for most consecutive skips is probably higher than you think. Try counting the skips in this footage of the world record. Just don't blink. Did you catch it? That was 88 skips. Here's the amazing thing. Models actually project the limit could be a lot higher than that. Today, we're gonna explore what that limit might be and why approaching or even exceeding it could be almost impossible. To find out what it takes, I skipped stones with the world record holder. What was that? Seven? Eight? You know, the odd thing is, I never count. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> you never count? I don't. Talked fluid dynamics with a physics. Oh, okay. So that's, that's just the beginning. And um, I'll move on to the, the next slide. So it's just how we get started in these in this show every time. And it's we set up the problem and then we, we talk about what, what makes it work. And uh, and then we we get into the nitty gritty. This one is, I think, 11 minutes long. I'm not going to have you watch the whole thing. I can I can send the, the link to it uh, if, if we want. But I'm, I'll show another clip from it in a second. Um, oh, I see why this isn't working. There we go. Um, so a little bit about me, um, as Josephine pointed out, I worked at the New York Times and I, I got to work on a lot of, of uh, really fascinating science stories. I did a story about catastrophic, catastrophic mega fires in Arizona almost 15 years ago. Um, and of course those fires have, have really become almost the standard in uh, the American West, which is where I live now. I live uh, in California and um, looking at the ways that climate change has, has really affected uh, American forests, in particular uh, Western forests. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to work with really amazing journalists who uh, helped arrange for me to be in places like operating rooms to, to see a kidney transplant for a story that I did. I worked with a colleague on about um, one of the longest kidney transplant chains ever undertaken at the time. Um, I reported on um, what it's like to be a citizen scientist in Montana and track wolverines. Um, so lots of things at the at the times, and I and that was one of the places that I really uh, learned how to report on on science, to speak with scientists, to speak with um, people whose lives are affected by um, scientific findings or or research. Uh, and then I ended up working at, at Wired, and at Wired, um, I was tasked really with, with making videos that appealed to both a broad audience and to the core audience of Wired. And I, I sort of think of this as a big Venn diagram, and one of the core parts of Wired's communication is around science and technology and engineering. And so this show, which I didn't create, um, Almost Impossible, came out of a uh, out of a a magazine article about Nike's quest to bake, break the two hour marathon with the runner Iliad Kipchoge. And some colleagues had, had spent a bunch of time working on, on a piece then about why that was so difficult, why it was almost impossible. And it was, a, it was very popular. And we'd spent a lot of time talking with scientists and researchers about everything from shoe design to metabolic function for, for runners. And we, we started to build a new series out of that that we called Almost Impossible. And I think we did maybe 20 of them all together. Um, stone skipping was one of them. We did one about the maximum number of hula hoops a person can spin, which is, uh, well, the, the world record is 200. Um, I'm happy to share links to all of these if, if folks are interested. Uh, we did one about uh, running the 100 meter uh, dash. Um, and I was lucky enough to find researchers who would open up their labs or, or spend time with me to, to explain usually a physical finding, usually physics um, or biomechanics about why it is that humans are stuck at the record that we're at right now um, or what it would take for us to get past it. Um, and since then, uh, I, oops, sorry, 
How do we go back? How do we go back? Every throw. So sorry. I can never remember how. You... There we go. I'm currently a freelancer, um, but I continue to to make science journalism a part of a lot of what I do. It just finds its way into a lot of the work that I do. I um, a couple of years ago, I worked on a podcast uh, for Apple that was a companion piece to a fictional show about uh, an alternate history of the space race that imagines that the Soviet Union got to the moon first called For, for All Mankind. And I worked on a podcast where we uh, discussed the real science that informed the show. So I, I talked with a lot of astronauts, former astronauts, uh, and um, one episode we talked about what you eat in space, and I spoke with a woman named Vicki Cloris, who ran the NASA food lab for a long time and worked there for, I think, a few decades, and talked about some of the really interesting things about packaging and, and taking food into outer space, which, of course, gets into a lot of interesting science. Um, so then I thought what we could do is we could watch, because the real point of this is to talk about how we talk about our science or talk about your science to the general population. I'm going to show you another clip from the from the video that I produced about about stone skipping that, that has our scientists explaining a bit about what they've found. Um, and um, and then afterwards, we can discuss a little bit about what how I approached him, how I coached him through the the uh, our interview and how we communicated uh, what we know about the physics of stone skipping. And again, if anybody has any questions, they want to raise their hand in the chat or, or just interrupt, uh, please do. Every throw is a complete new puzzle. So how is it that someone like Steiner can skip stones so many times? To find out, we asked Tad Truscott, who runs the Splash Lab at Utah State University in Logan. Yeah, the Splash Lab, welcome. Thanks, you've got a lot of really cool stuff in here. Yeah, it looks like junk, but we're using all of it. Yes, it's a real lab, and the work they do there is amazing. And then this tank here where I shot bullets into it for my uh, thesis, my PhD thesis. You shot bullets into this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, they were modified 22 bullets. Is that what yeah. that hole is yeah, right there? Yeah, yeah, it's where we missed, but that, that's a misfire, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> To study stone skipping, Truscott and his team recorded Steiner hurling stones into a tank at thousands of frames per second. To figure out how many skips are possible, you have to first understand just how a skip works. Here's what happens. So you have the stone, it's in your hand, and you throw it. And as you do that, you release it off of your fingers, and that causes it to have some spin. So the spin is really important. We call it gyroscopic stabilization. It essentially holds the attack angle of the, of the um, rock with respect to, say, the surface of the water. So then when you hit the water, it deforms the water and pushes a wave out in front of it. But the velocity of the stone is much faster than the wave that it creates. And so it ends up rising up on that wave that it created. And this causes a little lift force. The rock is able to go back into the air and then back down. And so this happens over and over and over again for a good rock skip, right? And that gyroscopic stabilization is what keeps that attack angle correct. And friction is really the only other thing that's like reducing your ability to keep going. The Splash Lab isn't the only one studying stone skipping. A group of French scientists first figured out a model for ideal skipping in 2004. These researchers in France found out that the optimal angle for a disc to skip on the water's surface is about 20 degrees for both the um, attack angle and also that velocity vector. That coupled with um, you know, how, how fast it is thrown as well as how much gyroscopic stabilization it has sort of set up the problem to find out what the maximum number of skips you can get or the number of skips you'll get based on what that spin rate is and what that velocity is and that uh, impact angle. Now, you might think that studying stone skipping is a bit frivolous, but Truscott says there are practical applications. Yeah, definitely. So a spacecraft that was proposed that would bounce off the atmosphere as it kind of came back towards Earth. And use that to keep itself out. You know, if you want to land on, say, the moon of Titan, you may want to, you may want to come in for a soft landing. Um, knowing how skipping works might be a great way to do that. To figure out how Steiner skips so many times, Truscott and his lab also went into the field to gather data on his arm speed and the rotation of the stones. All right! <laughs> I think that 
was it, dude. Steiner's maximum speed is around 50 miles an hour. His world record skip was calculated at 43 miles per hour. But he also has years of experience. Even his dud throws put my best efforts to shame. But could someone best his record? I've seen one or two people who have a technique that could maybe beat that, but uh, it's almost impossible. <laughs> <laughs> now you might remember from our previous episode on the fastball that pitchers are about maxed out on speed at just over 100 miles per hour. Trust could apply that metric to stone skipping and came up with some amazing calculations. All right, I'm just gonna pause it there. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how how we got how I got to to Tad Truscott and and then how I set up the interview because I think that might be helpful for for all of us to discuss how we explain science to a general population. So um, one of the because this show had been on for a little while um, as I was working on it, um, we would sort of identify whatever our our topic was. And then I would go often looking for somebody who had done research that had to do with with um, with the sport. And obviously, stone skipping is not Major League Baseball, where it was actually fairly easy to find people who had studied pitching mechanics. In fact, I found a researcher who has a uh, um, a foundation that's basically funded by Major League Baseball and other baseball uh, um, teams, and he does a lot of research on on how the, um, you know, like what on the biomechanics of of pitching in particular. So he had a lot of data and a lot of insight. But uh, stone skipping is not as lucrative as uh, as baseball, amazingly enough. But I, when I started thinking about it, and I I read the French paper, um, I was like, well, this is really just a fluid dynamicist problem. So I started doing some searching online for. Uh, interesting fluid dynamics, and I found the Splash Lab. It, it had a great name, and it uh, it came up fairly early in my in my searches. And then I reached out to Tad, and um, we arranged to have a phone call. And I I talked with him, and he said, "Yeah, this sounds super interesting. I I you know that's not exactly what I work on, but I'm I'm really fascinated by this sort of thing." And um, and then we started working on a day that we could all get together and and discuss it. But one of the things that I did is I did a lot of pre-interview with him. And um, so that's the prep part of my job, but it's also the prep part of your job if you're a, a, a scientist who's or a researcher who's trying to communicate what you do. So I had a phone call with him and you know, we discussed how we would simplify this and how we would make it as, as easy to understand for a general audience. I mean, obviously we all know what happens when a stone skips off the water, but breaking down what, what happens at the physics level is a lot more complicated. And there are different ways to approach that. I think if we'd had um, the budget and the time to do really fascinating motion graphics, you know, like animations, we might've been able to do something like that and really gotten into things like the spin rate. But as we, he and I talked, um, it became pretty clear that he would be able to explain this in a really simple way. And um, if you go, if you think back to what he was describing about what we understand, one of the things that I really liked about that when we did the interview was I asked him like, can you do this without using a lot of insider terms, a lot of physics terms necessarily. And he mostly talks about things like spin rate. I mean, I think he did talk about gyroscopic stabilization, but I think most of us understand what that is. He's talking about things like speed and the splash. You know, he's not using insider terms. He's using really simple terms that are the terms that most of us use. And I think that that's one of the techniques that you can use whenever you're discussing anything scientific with the general population, at least at the beginning, is to start as broad as possible and as approachable as possible with simple terms that um, maybe you've already heard this before. This is sort of a classic um, question prompt in my circle, in journalism circles, is like, how do you explain this to a five-year-old? And um, uh, Tad and I got to talking and it turned out he had a few kids. And I said, well, how do you explain things like this to your kids? And he said, oh, I think I can probably do that because they asked me about what I do for work all the time. And um, if you've got kids or you spend time talking to kids, you know, you often need to make things as easy to understand as possible. And um, actually, I think the way that that uh, Josephine found me was that she was looking 
to have somebody talk about this show that was made by some other colleagues that I wasn't involved in at Wired called um, Five Levels. And I'll show a beginning clip of, of one of those. But it was, it was sort of based on this idea, which is like, how do you start at the at the most basic? And then they do five levels of increasingly complicated or complex explanation of a difficult to understand uh, subject, things like uh, quantum mechanics or, um, you know, I don't know that they've done one on large language model uh, AI systems, but that would be another one. Um, so sort of like at the very basic uh, level, like how would you explain this to a kid? And I thought that, that Tad did a really great job of explaining like, this is what happens when a stone hits the water, it hits at this angle. So an angle about like this, he's showing it to me visually, which is really important to me as a video journalist. How do I, how do I show show this information um and you know obviously sports is sort of uh easy for some of this sort of stuff because it's a physical thing that happens in the real world it's not microscopic it's not at the molecular level um it's not it doesn't involve chemical reactions that can't easily be seen uh, um, without uh, special tools so it's all stuff that happens out there physically um but he's showing us and then he's showing us with the stone what happens just the way that you might explain it to a to a kid um so let me show you a little bit of of this this other show which is uh called five levels and it's been also really popular and i think that it's a good um it's a good show to watch if you're thinking about it, how you might explain something complicated because they've gotten researchers just like many of you who have been tasked with this challenge of explaining whatever it is that they work on uh, to a child, then, you know, like a, a five or six year old, and then usually uh, somebody who might be in junior high, a high schooler, a grad student, and then to uh, a colleague who probably also has a PhD. Um, so let's just watch the beginning clip of this as well. Hi, I'm Jana Levin. I'm an astrophysicist, and I've been asked to explain gravity in five levels of increasing complexity. Gravity seems so familiar and so everyday, and yet it's this incredibly esoteric, abstract subject that has shaped the way we view the universe on the largest scales, has given us the strangest phenomena in the universe like black holes, that has changed the way we look at the entirety of physics. It's really been a revolution because of gravity. Are you interested in science? Yes. Yes, you are? Yes. Do you know what gravity is? It's something that, so right now, we would be floating if there was no gravity, but since there's gravity, we're sitting right down on these chairs. That's pretty good. So gravity wants to attract us to the Earth, yes. and the Earth to us. But the Earth is so much bigger that even though we're actually pulling the Earth a little bit to us, you don't notice it so much. You know, the moon pulls on the Earth a little bit. Just like um, with the ocean tides. Exactly. Well, the moon is such a big body compared to anything else very nearby that it has the larger effect pulling the water of the earth. But more than the moon, think about the sun pulling on the earth. We orbit the whole sun just the way the earth pulls on the moon and causes the moon to orbit us. All of those things are acting on you and me right now. If gravity was too strong, would we be able to get up? That's such a good question. No. We actually couldn't. The moon, gravity is weaker, can almost float between footsteps if you look at the astronauts on the moon. Yeah. On the Earth, it's harder because it's bigger. If you go to a bigger, heavier planet, it gets harder and harder. But there are stars that have died that are so dense that there's no way we could lift our arms, no way we could step or walk. The, yeah. the gravity is just way too strong. Do you know how tall you are? I'm in the... Okay. So I'd love to talk a little bit about some of the work that any of you are doing right now. And maybe we can talk a little bit about challenges that you have in terms of how you communicate that and maybe making it more simple, maybe making it more approachable for a, a general population. Does anybody want to volunteer and talk about their work? Um, I can jump in and say something. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, so um, so I am a neuroscientist uh, and I work with songbirds and I essentially look at 
how um, uh, I look at uh, gene activation in the brain in specific regions and how that changes based on social context. Uh, so you had mentioned, you know, it's really good to, um, when you're speaking to public facing audiences, kind of like with these things that happen below, you know, the level of things that we can see, like you know, throwing a ball in baseball, like brain activation, it's harder to kind of describe those things because people might not have like sort of a grasp on what that could, like just a general concept of how that could mean. So I was wondering if you had any like tips for how to introduce like these like really tiny topics that people might not uh, have a lot of uh, experience with in their like day-to-day -day lives. Sure. Let me ask, do you study human brains and songbirds or do you study songbird brains? I study songbird brains, um, but they kind of are similar to humans. Um, they learn song in a similar way that humans uh, learn speech. Okay, cool. Do you have access to a CT scanner that you can put a songbird into while it's singing? <laughs> we actually do, but it's really hard. Uh, yeah, I don't I know bet. if you could put one in while they're singing, but they're just so small. I I asked because some colleagues actually worked on, we worked on a video about your brain and music. And part of it, there was a researcher here uh, at UCSF who was working on improvisation. So he, he, he gets um, jazz pianists and um, uh, he'd actually built a, a, um, a piano keyboard that had no metal in it so that they could play it. And then also working with like uh, freestyle hip hop rappers and um, and poets, and having them lie down in his in his CT scanner and and was doing brain imaging while they while they imp improvise and was looking at different parts of the brain. And obviously, you know, for video, that's a, a way that you can that you can show some of that. Um, I think that. You know, I think something like a, a songbird song and what you were just saying is really interesting, right? Like, I don't know if if the research that you've done um, suggests the way that they learn songs is similar to the way that humans learn learn songs or learn tunes or learn language, um, if that's the kind of research that you do. But sometimes, you know, I think often when we're talking to the general public, if there's a way to connect what you do what your findings are to something that most people can relate to, that's always helpful. I mean, one of the reasons I think that that our show about sports was popular is that many of us care about sports, even sports that aren't, you know, like nobody watches the world championship of, of stone skipping. Well, some people do, but not the same way that they watch, you know, like the NBA finals. Um, but it is something that a lot of us have done, right? And there's this, that, that sort of like, I know this, like, you know, I think that that's part of it is like, do you ever get a song stuck in your head? I don't know if that's, uh, if that's the way that a bird learns their songs. I, I've, I've read a little bit about how uh, some birds have actually learned car alarm sounds. And I don't know if that's something that, that you've worked on, but you know, that, that like, we think of songbird songs as maybe, um, you know, sort of, ancient songs that they've always sung but like the, the fact that they can learn a new one is pretty interesting or if if there's some understanding from your research about the ways that different parts of the brain are activated and like maybe we know that those parts of the brain are associated with memory or with um you know with happiness or contentment or or something like that i don't know maybe you can tell me a little bit more about what it is that you've found and then maybe we can we can uh talk a little bit about how you might package that for a, a general population i'm fascinated i want to learn more um yeah so i so essentially like the work so far in in birds and I think most model organisms is, um, you know, the brain is very complex and there's like a lot of different regions feeding into each other. So people will work with like either one region or one like limited circuit for a very specific behavior, like a motor behavior um, and just kind of focus on that. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to link like two individual circuits together in the songbird brain. Uh, so I have one circuit that's been very well defined for um, learning and then producing 
these songs. And then a second uh, circuit that's not as well defined, uh, but exists across vertebrates uh, just for social behaviors in general. So I'm looking at how these two circuits talk to each other uh, to allow the bird to change their song based on the social context. So if they're singing by themselves, their song is like, a little bit more variable, but if they're singing to a potential mate, then their song is like incredibly stereotyped a little bit faster. There's like small changes that happen. That's super interesting. It has, <laughs> I mean, I think that's really interesting. Um, do we know if there's something like that in humans as well? Do we, do we have similar data about the way that human speech or song or communication works in, in our brains and, and in social contexts? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I feel like we definitely, you know, we have the behavioral data in ourselves, you know, like if you think of yourself like singing in the shower versus singing like on stage, like you're gonna see a behavioral change there even in yourself. So that is like, you know, aligned with the birds. Uh, the these regions the the social regions would exist in humans the 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 regions for producing song it's less defined in humans you know because we can't really <laughs> get in there and look <laughs> as easily so uh the general like brain regions not like specific named tiny regions but more broad like cortex and like striatum those would exist in humans and like similar circuits are, are thought to be there, but we don't know as much. I think that's really interesting. I thought what you said about singing in the shower versus maybe singing on stage would be the kind of thing that you might, you might use if you were, if you needed to talk about this with a general population is that, um, you know, in some ways birds are a little bit like us. Like when they sing in the, sh in the shower, when they sing by themselves, they're, they sing, they sing like nobody's listening, maybe. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's what, what your data says, but um, you know, that's, that's an interesting way for, I think, the general population to sort of think about, like, when I hear a bird singing, you know, like, it could be a little bit like listening to a bird sing in the shower, or it's like listening to my neighbor sing in the shower, which is a lot different than, than going to a show or, or like two birds singing to each other or a number of birds singing to each other. Um, which is really interesting, right? Like, I think that that gets at the social nature of birds, which is something that um, I think a lot of people are probably interested in. Um, and I think that there's a lot there to, to tease at, but I think that like at a very high level, you know, I like got a very simple level, like, you know, like that, that can be the beginning of sort of how you explain what it is that you do, say to a kid, right? You know, if, it, if you were explaining this to a five-year-old, what would you what would you say? Because I think that's often a really good place to start. It's like, you know, I don't know if you have uh, kids in your life, you know, nieces or nephews or neighbor's kid or something, you know, if they asked you, what do you do? And you say, well, I study songbirds. And this is what I, you know, I, do you, have you ever noticed that when you sing in the shower by yourself, it's a little different than the way that you might sing if you're at choir practice or with your friends? Songbirds are a little bit like that too. And that's one of the things that I, I do research on is trying to figure out why they're different, why they, why they sing like that, um, and also how they learn how to sing or, what, or whatever, your, whatever your work is. Um, but yeah, that's, and then I think you can, start to, um, you can start to sort of get deeper as you go with, with a reporter or with a, with a journalist. Um, you know, I tend to think about things in sort of both the the idea and also the visual representation and um just because of the work that i do but you know i don't know if there's if there is you know obviously listening to a listening to the audio file of a songbird singing two different ways and like being able to show maybe it's even showing like the waveforms and like where things change and maybe that that you can also i don't know if there's any way i don't know if you use you know like brain imaging or brain stimulation devices or something that like records brain activity, but maybe there's also like a way to show, here's what's interesting that happens in the brain of the bird while it's singing by itself. Here's what happens while, while it's singing with others and you see like different activations and you could have those track at the same time visually across a screen, which would, I think would be a really visual way to show and also um, an audio way to show 
what's happening and then you know what what does that mean um what is what do we understand about birds what do we understand about the way that um that information gets shared between between birds and between other uh other animals that's awesome patrick i'm like picturing i'm actually picturing the birds and like visuals like it could be a cartoon or whatever of the waves kind of going by and how that's different when they're intentionally singing for whatever audience and again we might be totally i this is not obviously at the level okay <laughs> the size that you're doing like a more, more, i just think that those analogies and singing in the shower and you know and then the visuals is really helpful as you're trying to engage a five-year-old or a high schooler, right? Or a even a college student about some of the work that you're doing. Um, is there is there somebody else who wants to to talk to Patrick a little bit about some of the work that you're doing and like workshop? Do I see Yamali? Am I pronouncing that right? Go ahead, Yamali. Yes, thank you, Yamali. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, well, I'm a marine biologist and I work on sea anemones. And I work on evolution and I'm interested in how the environment and how geological events impact the, the species distribution. So I'm working specifically in one species and that is distributing the whole Pacific area. And there are three colors. Well, you can see it here, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in my office. So here, the whole Pacific area, right? But the three colors follow a different pattern of distribution. So the first thing for me is like to identify if they are actually the same species. And after that, if they are or not, to see how the, the different population, for example, the, the Mexican ones or the Chilean or the Peruvian ones, if they like interbreed or something to see how in the future this distribution patterns are going to change so that's what i'm interested in <laughs> very interesting i mean i think you know i have a friend who's uh uh who does a lot of stories on marine biology i, I think mostly because he really loves diving um oh. but he, <laughs> um but uh you know i think that, that something like sea and enemies is, is super interesting i think a, a lot like catherine's question you've got something that that i think a lot of people are are you know it's a physical it's big it's you know like they're they're living organisms which i think people have a, a the general population already has like a little bit more understanding of and um an appreciation of and again i would i would ask sort of what is it about your research that maybe affects people if you're talking about like how how does how do you present this research to to a general population and some of that is and i don't mean this in a in a critical way i just it's just a way to start sort of framing is like why should i care right like why why should the general population care and um part of it is is that it's it's your job as a researcher who's talking to the press to to make them care in a way right so if if the evolution of of this particular um sea anemone affects some other part of of uh the bio I, as far as i know people don't eat sea anemones right like i often think about seafood and like what people care about i've done some some work on stories around um salmon in particular and um you know people oh, particularly on the yeah, yeah sure right yeah like, like i've done some stories on on farm salmon and some stories on on wild salmon and and um you know people have a very strong connection because of salmon as a food way for a lot of cultures. Um, but I think, you know, just like songbirds, people may have a connection because it's a part of their lives, right? I don't know if there's a way that sea anemones or like the, the ecosystem that they live in is a really a, an important part of, of a lot of people's lives, but that might be a way to frame it is, you know, like, you know, an understanding of, of why an ecosystem is the way it is and the importance of this particular organism. You know, I think that that's one of the things that the people who study, um, uh, you know, parts of, of a biological system that are maybe not the biggest charismatic megafauna um, often run into, you know, like people study, 
insects, you know, I think even getting people interested in in colony collapse around bees was, you know, was was quite a, a feat for a lot of scientists, right? I mean, for a lot of researchers, because insects aren't something that we think about the same way that we think about birds and bears. And, and you know, there's, there's a reason that a lot of um, wildlife organizations use, you know, a panda as their, as their logo, not, um, not a smaller um, animal like a, an insect, even though insects are super important. So that would be sort of my challenge to you is, is like, sort of how do you package what you're finding um, in a way that, that connects it to something that's important to, to the general population? And maybe you can, if you want, we can just talk a little bit about that. Like, what, what have you found? What is it, does it have, is the evolution of this species have to do with, with um, something higher up the food chain um, that eats them or that's part of their, you know, part of the, um, the ecosystem that you're, that you're studying? Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Well, as a part of the change food, well, Spain, Chilean, and Peruvian people eat anemones. Oh, it's not great. very common, but yeah, they eat them. Actually, in Spain, yeah, there's a huge population that eats sea anemones. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and well, in the like in ecology importance, where they have relationship with other organisms. So and help them like to survive in that environment with crabs, a snail, other anemones. So yeah, and this relationship helped them right, to survive there. And yeah, well, if we go and we see more, for example, they have these, they have venom, so compounds that people can use them, you know, to de develop some drugs as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but they are not as important as corals. So it's a little bit like, oh, how you know, I make them. Make them I think even out. those those things are fascinating though. Like, and I, you know, I imagine I saw that a few of the people who are who are joining us or planning to join um, are looking at things like how do you communicate climate change. I don't know if if the way that you know if if ocean acidification or um, a warming ocean is changing what you're seeing with with these species, but that could be another angle to take. And um, I think there's, if they have a venom that uh, has been used or, or might be used in a, in a drug, that's a super fascinating um, part of their, of their physiology that, that definitely could connect the, connect them to me, even if I'm, I, I don't uh, consume them as a foodstuff or interact with them on a daily basis. Otherwise, I'm not saying you need to have that, but I think that that can sometimes be the, the way that you that you present your findings to a to a larger population. Mm, okay. Okay. And maybe you explain it. I mean, I would also challenge you to think about it in terms of like, what have you found, and uh, or what are you researching, and what do you hope to find, and how would you explain that to a kid? Because I think again, that is often like a really good way. You know, like, do you remember these these? You, have you ever seen these in the ocean? You know, like. What's really interesting about them is it's pretty they, common in the intertidal zone. They're pretty common, and they are super right. useful in in our, what is it, aquariums. Uh -huh. So they're pretty, yeah. and some are super expensive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some anemones, right? Not the species that I'm working on, but yeah, other ones. Well, that's really neat, and I think that you know, I think if there's something about what you've discovered about their evolution based on on geology and and where they the, the geography of, that they live in that could be the kind of thing that you could explain to you know at a pretty basic level to to kids and to a general population and then I think even explaining that that they have that they have a defense mechanism that's venomous and um, we usually think of that as being dangerous but that there there are things that there are compounds in their venom that we think might be useful for for curing diseases or helping people in, in different ways. Like that's, I realize that may not be exactly what the research that you're doing is, but that can be a way to, to sort of mm -hmm. make, connect. That's the attention, right? Yeah, that's connect people. connect the subject matter to a, to a, a broader audience. Mm, okay, yeah. Hi. Can I, can I, I'm just gonna share something that I quickly, as soon as you talked about, started talking about migration patterns, from different countries and them potentially um, 
uh, breeding to to make new species. I and this is only because this is because I'm thinking about this currently. Is I'm thinking about a lot of my familial roots in the Philippines pre-colonization. And so I actually, in my mind, as soon as you said that, started thinking about the maps from Austria, you know, the Austronesians and the Malays and people and how people have migrated to make different races or different ethnicities. And, and that, you know, I mean, we're talking about sea anemones and I'm talking about my ancestors. So it's different, but I actually pictured that map that I've been looking at a lot as I'm, I'm looking at my family research. So again, it's that like, how could I made that initial, um, you know, comparison because that's what I'm thinking about now, but that's another way to think about comparing it to what people might find interesting is like human migration. This has happened as well. And it's happening not right now, actually, as we speak um, and how that relates to what's happening in the sea world, the world of the sea and the ocean. Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's an, another way to put it. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's just serendipitous that I have it. The analogy. Uh huh. Mm. Um, Patrick, I'm gonna. We have about six minutes, so I don't okay. know if we need to wrap up the workshop portion and talk a little bit about um, speaking with journalists. Um, sure. Yeah. I, yeah. Of course. Um, I'm happy to to do a little bit of a of a mock interview if anybody wants to do that or I can sort of talk a little bit about ways to prepare for an interview if that's helpful and tell me what's what's most useful for for all of you like prepare in like how <laughs> I like I'm interested in that <laughs> yeah well maybe we should talk about that so um you know, if, if a journalist is coming to re, to or calls you up on the phone and or, or makes a request to talk with you, maybe how you can prepare to be ready to do that. And I can talk a little bit about what it's like to be on camera um, and ways that you can prepare for that as well. And in, in case that's the, the way that you're going to be communicating your your science. Um, but usually. Uh, it's it's pretty uncommon for you to just get a, a cold phone call and somebody wants to know about your research. It's usually, you know, they, they send an email and they set up a time to talk with you and um, and then they, they maybe they've read your paper or they've read some work that you've been involved in, that kind of thing. Um, but I can tell you a little bit about, you know, I think that that some of it is doing what we were just discussing, which is like, how do you how do you make things a little bit more simple and i'm just going to go to my next slide interview prep um so you can prepare the journalist is probably prepared you you hope that they've done some preparation maybe they've done some background research maybe they've um they've talked to other people who study the same thing that you've studied if they're if they're writing about it or making a video about it um but they are also are also probably a, a member of the general public as well. They're probably not, some of them may have a science background, but not all of them. So you should be prepared to explain things to them uh, in the same way that we were just discussing. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the inverted pyramid. This is an old journalism uh, tool, which is that you you start with your, your sort of the biggest idea and then you get more granular as you go down and everything gets more uh, detailed. And it comes from, uh, from when they used to actually physically cut stories by paper. So it'd be like, you know, like uh, the story can only be so long because it needs to fit in a physical space. And so they would actually literally cut off the bottom of it. So you, at least that way you had the, the big idea at the top and then the ideas would, would get more complex or more detailed as you go. But the, th the thinking was that um, as you go, if you needed to cut off the bottom, you would not be leaving the reader without enough information. So that can be a way to think about the way that you put together your information. So it's a lot like if you're, at least I, I read papers sometimes, but I, I haven't written one, but it's a lot like the, the abstract, right? You start with your abstract and then as you go into the paper, you get into those details. So I think in a lot of ways, it's like, what is that, that idea that the five-year-old or the general population can start with? And then where do you sort of, how do you build that? Get, be ready to, 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 um, to go into more detail. You know, so if it's sea anemones, you know, it might be just explaining what sea anemones are and the, and the kind of work that you do. And then it's getting into 
Um, here's how I do my research. Here are some of the findings that I've that I've had. Here's what this means for for these ecosystems. Um, I think one of the other things that you should think about is the journey of discovery, and um, that is that can be a lot of things, right? It can be like, well, how did you get interested in this? You know, like it, it doesn't just have to be about your research. You know, science reporting is often about what makes a scientist interested in something. Where did the where did the question come from? Why are they Why are we interested in the in in sea anemones? Why are we interested in why songbird songs are different uh, depending on their on their um, they're where they're located or where they're if they're with other songbirds uh, and along with that comes obstacles and breakthroughs and i think that that can be uh you know science is is often being proven wrong and then going back to the drawing board and trying to figure things out again and i think that in some ways discussing some of that can be uh, a big part of the story that you communicate you know we've we've been stuck trying to figure out why songbirds sing this way for a very long time. I don't know if that's true. I'm just saying, and then maybe there's a new tool that's made it easier for us to understand, or maybe there's been a breakthrough that you've been involved in. Explaining that and why it's important is, is part of what you can do as a, as a scientist, as you get ready to talk to a journalist. Um, I didn't write anything down about this, but in the last couple of minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about what I would recommend if you are going to be interviewed over the radio or over, uh, or for video, which is um, try to do it in your office or your research space if you can. I think that's always a, an interesting place, you know, like having having the maps and um, tools and things like that that you use behind you is really great for video. Um, if you can, make sure that it's a quiet day. So if you know if you have a uh, I've been to labs that are really loud. Um, so, you know, like if you have a a machine that runs with a sixty cycle hum in the background, it might not be the best place to do it. Um, and obviously, I know that you know lots of labs just need to run twenty four seven because you're doing experiments, that kind of thing. So it might be do it in an office or find a different place. You can often work with um, with a, a communications advisor from uh, a, if you're part of a university or even a company. They usually have somebody who will help you find a good quiet space to do it in. That's also um, interesting. Um, I would also say just be comfortable. You know, it's obviously being being interviewed is um, is probably not exactly the reason that you got into the sciences. You probably got into the sciences because you're interested in, in doing field work or, or doing lab work. Um, but if you can be as comfortable as possible, that will make your interview go a lot, a lot better as well. I know we have a, maybe we have a minute or two. If anybody has any other questions, I'm, I'm happy to stay on for a minute to, to uh, answer any questions. I'm just also going to jump in and say I could not, that could not have been the more perfect segue because next month's Communicating Your Science uh, webinar is our Meet the Reporter webinar, where um, we will be giving our scientists an opportunity to meet with a reporter to be interviewed. So I'm actually going to share the um, registration form for that. That is going to be on April 21st at 2 p.m. Um, so use some of what Patrick has talked to us about today as you prepare to meet one of the journalists that we're going to be bringing on board for next month's webinar. Terrific. Anybody have any other questions? No. Patrick, thank you so much. This was, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, if, <laughs> yeah, it's common, well, it's not that common, right? As you said, that someone's going to call you, but how, if you want to share your your project, who should you reach out to? Like, mm. who, you know, like, sure. Someone, oh, I want to show, you know, to make it bigger. So, yeah, I can talk to other ones, but not only scientists, also. Mm non-science people you know like yeah yeah i mean i think that so it's kind of a funny thing um i would work with with your communications department i've certainly picked up on interesting science findings because a communications department has put out a press release that's about an interesting finding um i think that a lot of journalists are 
like prefer to get their information that way um, and and their leads for a story that way. Um, people may find you just because they happen to be working on a story. Maybe somebody's working on a story about um, something that has to do with sea anemones in the Pacific, and they found that you've done research that touches on something that they're interested in in, in exploring in their in their story. So that's that's often the way that I have found people is that I have found scientists is that I've been working on a story about something and I uh, want to know more about it. So I've reached out to scientists who who work in that area. But I think that the press releases that go out to uh, or that are available on a website that are easy to find. I mean, obviously you can have a good website uh, that has, you know, has um, uh, links to your work, to, um, you know, to, to your papers or papers that you've co-authored, all that sort of thing. Maybe a, a quick bio about who you are and what you do and, and how you do it. Those all, all those kinds of things can, can help you be found if you, if you do want to be, if you do want to talk more to the press about, about what you're doing. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. might um, it be helpful to connect with Katie with the SciComm working group around? Um, so, the, the, do you guys? You guys already connected already? <laughs> I feel like you probably know each other <laughs> um, because um, Katie and Sarah's group do a lot of work around reaching out to folks about science, their science and how to best get the word out. Um, but if there is a story you want to tell, um, obviously, you, if you can reach out to me or and or Sean Rea, who's the director of our um, community outreach and um, media over at the, the Advanced, Advanced Science Research Center. Um, and I have your information. And if, if you, you know, she can she can help you get the word out as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, oh, you're welcome. Um, Patrick, thank you. I feel like this was a long time planning and we're so, <laughs> it was a really, uh, really yeah. good presentation. I appreciate it. We are going to um, put this up on our YouTube channel. Uh, you know, we did have almost 30 folks register and for whatever reason, um, they weren't able to make it. So hopefully they'll be able to utilize it once it's up. Um, and I'll show, share sure. that information with you as well in case you want access to it. Um, but great. Please, everybody, fill out your survey. Um, I'll follow up with you all around the next CYS. And um, thank you for taking time out today. Thank you. It was fascinating to hear about your work. I'm I'm now all the more interested in sea anemones and songbirds than I was an hour ago. <laughs> great. <laughs> that, means they, that, that means they did a really really great job, right? Talking about it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I think I think you're on your way to communicating communicating with the general population. Um, I'll share my email with uh, with Josephine, and if if you have any follow up questions or if there's something I can help you with, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, take care. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.